Today is day one in chapter two, section four, and there are two different objectives. The first objective is the square root property, and the second would be a quick introduction to completing the square. If you haven't done so already, I'd like you to hit pause on the video and attempt the three warm up problems. Hit play when you're ready to go over them. Okay, uh, number one, it says write x minus five squared as a trinomial. So a trinomial means having three terms. So ax squared plus bx plus c is what it should look like. And in order to do that, we'd have to rewrite x minus five being squared as x minus five times x minus five. Because remember, something being squared is equivalent to something times itself. So if I want it to be a trinomial, I'm going to have to FOIL this. Remember, FOIL stands for first, outside, inside, last. That gives me x squared minus 5x minus 5x plus 25. Or if I combine like terms, you have x squared minus 10x plus 25. Number two, you had to factor the expression. I was hoping you would recognize that this is a perfect square trinomial because a would be x, b would be 9, and you see how that middle term is 2 times a times b, uh, with the signs being minus plus, that means that I have x minus 9 being squared. If it was a plus plus, it would have been x plus 9 squared. You could have also used guess and check since a was 1, listing out the factors of 81, 9 and 9, using same signs, minus, minus, you'd get x minus 9 times x minus 9, or x minus 9 squared. Number 3, it said to solve by factoring. However, if you list out the factors of 3, there's no way we could get the middle term of 10, meaning that this is not factorable. But what you'll see when we do completing the square in our next class is just because it's not factorable doesn't mean it doesn't have a solution. Uh, you actually can use completing the square to solve any quadratic function. But for now, let's take a look at square roots. Um, before I go over the square root property, we need to remind ourselves on how we would simplify radicals. In order for a radical to be simplified, there can be no perfect square factor inside the radical, so underneath the root sign, and there can be no radical or root in the denominator. When I say perfect square, I'm talking about 1, 4, 9, 16, 25. You can list them out as far as you want to go. I'm going to go all the way up to 12 being squared. So this is what I'm referencing when I say perfect squares. Numbers that you can obtain by squaring some other number. Um, if I wanted to, let's, let's start with uh, part A. If I wanted to simplify radical 75, well, I need to think about the factors of 75 that could be perfect squares. So I have 1 and 75. Um, 75 is not divisible by 4, 9, or 16. It is divisible by 25, though. I know that 25 times 3 would give me 75. Um, and you can keep dividing 75 by the other perfect squares, but you'll see that these are our only factors that we can use. You always want to pick a uh, a perfect square other than 1, so in this case what I'm going to be using is 25 times 3. Now I can rewrite the square root of 75 as the square root of 25 times 3. And using what's called the product property, I can split this apart. So again, that's called product property. So if I want to split up the radical, I'd have the square root of 25 times the square root of 3. I wanted to do it this way because you can see if I have the square root of 25, well, the perfect square of 5. 25 is a perfect square of 5. So square root of 25 is 5, and the square root of 3 cannot be simplified any further because the factors are 1 and 3. 
there are no perfect squares greater than one. So that's my answer. Let's try another one, part B. If I think about the factors of 18 that could be greater, um, that can be perfect squares greater than one, I can see nine times two working. So I can rewrite square root of 18 as nine times two. Using product property, I can split that apart. The square root of nine would just be three because nine was a perfect square of three. And the square root of two cannot be simplified any further because the factors um, of two are one and two. All right, part C. If I'm thinking about the factors of 108, I have 4 and 27, but that's not all. There also is 36 times 3. Again, you always want to use the bigger square root, and I'll show you why. Okay? Uh, I, let's say I didn't recognize that 36 times 3 was 108. I went with the 4 times 27. So 4 times 27 would be the way that I rewrite it using product property. Oops, excuse me one second. There we go. Using product property, I can break it apart. So the square root of 4 times the square root of 27, that's 2 root 27. Now, the issue here, the reason why I can't leave it this way, is because if I think of the factors of 27, there's 1 in 27 9 and 3. 9 is a perfect square. So I actually can rewrite 27 as 9 times 3. And I have to simplify that. So product property, I split it up all over again. Root 9, root 3. So that gives me 2 times 3 times root 3 or 6 root 3. That's a whole lot of unnecessary work. Why don't we just start with the biggest perfect square. So instead of doing it this way, I'd rewrite it as root 36 times 3. Use product property. So that just gives me 6 root 3. Notice how we got to the same answer. But for this one, I had to do it multiple times. Whereas this one, since I started with the biggest perfect square, I only had to do it once. Part D, we have the square root of 64. Uh, 64 actually is a perfect square of 8, so 8 is the answer, and that's it. So whenever you have the square root of a perfect square, you just get the number, a whole number. Part E, this is uh, what I was talking about up here. We cannot have a root in the denominator, okay? That's not proper form. So when this happens, we would have to rationalize it. I'm just gonna do a quick intro here. Um, we're gonna really use this idea a lot later on. But in order to rationalize, you would multiply by the denominator over itself. So I have root two in the denominator. To rationalize, I would multiply by root two over root two. The reason why it has to be root 2 over root 2 is because technically this is equivalent to 1. And when you multiply something by 1, you just get itself. I'm not actually changing the numerical value of this. I'm just rewriting it. So I have root 7 times root 2 over root 2 times root 2. So root 7 over root or times root 2 over root 2 times root 2. So product property, we used it before to break it apart so we could simplify, but it actually works in the opposite direction as well. If I have something that's split up, I can put it back together. So I have something that's split up, I can put it back together. So 7 times 2 is 14, 2 times 2 is 4. Well, if it's over the square root of 4, 4 is a perfect square of 2, meaning I have root 14 over 2. So I no longer have a radical in the denominator, which is what I wanted. And 
I just need to double check. Can I simplify root 14 any further? The answer is no. The factors of 14 are 1 and 14, 2 and 7. None of those are perfect squares greater than 1. So that's my final answer. Part F, I do not have a radical in the denominator, but that does not mean it's in its most simplified form. I want you to notice how in the numerator, I can simplify the square root of 18 because the square root of 18 is equivalent to the square root of 9 times 2. And using product property, I can split that up, remember? So really, I have 3 root 2 over 6. But again, I'm still not done because you can simplify the whole number. See how 3 over 6 is equivalent to 1 half? Meaning that really, my final answer is root 2 over 2. Now that we've practiced simplifying radicals, we're ready to take a look at the square root property. So using the square root property is what we do when we're actually solving for x. All we've done so far is simplified radicals. We're actually going to solve and have two solutions. I want you to read this part right here that says, to solve a quadratic equation, you can take the square root of both sides. I'm going to underline that. Be sure to find both the positive and negative root. Starting with part A. If I'm going to be using the square root property, I need to isolate the term that is being squared. So the first thing you should do is isolate term being squared. For part A, I have x squared. So I need to solve and get it so I have x squared by itself. First thing I need to do is get rid of this 4. So the opposite of subtracting 4 is adding 4 to each side. That gives me 3x squared equals 72. The x squared is still not by itself because it's currently being multiplied by 3. So doing the opposite would be to divide by 3. x squared equals 24. Now, to solve for x, I'm going to be using the square root property. What you do to one side, you have to do to the other. So I'm going to take the square root of each side. Whenever you take the square root of both sides, you must put a plus or minus with the radical. Okay, I'll say that again. Whenever you take the square root of both sides, you must put plus or minus. We didn't put plus or minus anywhere up here because we were just simplifying. I didn't actually take the square root of anything. All right? Now, I can't just say, okay, yep, that's my final answer, plus or minus root 24. You need to see, can I simplify further? And the answer is yes, I can. So 24 can be written, rewritten as, I have plus or minus the square root, um, I have, let's see, 4 times 6. 4 times 6 gives me 24. Using product property, I can split that up, so I have root 4 times root 6, or plus or minus 2 root 6. This means I have two solutions, positive 2 root 6 and a negative to root 6. Part B. First thing I need to do is isolate the term being squared. So I need to isolate this x squared. So I'm just going to add 4 to each side. x squared equals 4. Now I need to take the square root of both sides. And since I took the square root, I need to put plus or minus root 4. 4 is a perfect square of 2, so that means I have two solutions, a positive 2 and a negative 2. All right, I'm just about out of time, so part 2 video will start off with C in example 2.